monomer is a very large molecule made up from a repeating sequence of smaller units called monomers. For example, here is the monomer chloroethene. As you can see, it's unsaturated because it has a double bond. You need an initiator such as a peroxide, which has a weak oxygen-oxygen bond. This easily undergoes homolysis into two radicals under heat or light. A radical is a species with an unpaired electron. The first alkene reacts with this to form a carbon-centred radical. This adds to another molecule of the alkene, and so on. This is called addition polymerization, and incredibly long polymer molecules are formed by a chain reaction. So in the case of our example, the monomers add together to form polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. Paper has been tabbed as one of the more environmentally friendly alternatives to plastics. Yeah, it has its advantages, it's easy to print on, cheap to produce, and it can be moulded and coated, and it's light. But there is a raging debate going on as to whether, when you consider all the processes involved in the life cycle of both types of packaging, whether paper is actually the more sustainable of the two. One argument that you will often hear is that paper is recyclable, and so it must be better, well, yes, it is recyclable, but so are many plastics. In fact, it takes 91% less energy to recycle a pound of plastic than a pound of paper, and it's not even bound to degrade quickly. This is down to pH and temperature. Also, according to a 2007 study by Bowsted Consulting & Associates, it takes four times as much energy to produce a paper bag as it does a polyethylene bag, and 20 times as much fresh water. Most paper comes from tree pulp. Each year, the USA consumes 10 billion paper grocery bags, requiring 14 million trees. Greenhouse gases are also produced in the manufacturing of paper packaging as the process involves heating wood chips under high temperatures in chemical solution. So paper doesn't look like such a sustainable option now, does it? Many now argue that it's a myth that paper is more environmentally friendly than plastic. After all, both are recyclable, but both are a drain on natural resources. makes a polymer biodegradable. Green chemists have put together this set of rules to make a successful degradable polymer. Natural products are all biodegradable, so structures closely resembling natural materials are likely to biodegrade. 
This is why cellulose is used to make synthetic biodegradable polyesters. It is a polysaccharide, which is a long carbohydrate molecule consisting of a linear chain of over 10,000 glucose units. Catechol is an intermediate in the degradation of aromatics, so aromatic products that do not contain two adjacent unsubstituted or hydroxyl substituted carbon atoms will degrade more slowly. Highly electronegative groups, such as the nitro group, decrease the rate of degradation of substituted aromatics. Heterocyclic species are cyclic compounds that have atoms of at least two different elements as a member of its ring. These species are slow to biodegrade. This is because the degradation of these molecules involves a stepwise removal of the substituted groups, destruction of the rings and progressive alteration of the constituent units. Highly branched aliphatic chains degrade more slowly than linear chains. This is because the alternative pathways required to cleave side chain methyl groups proceed more slowly. Aliphatic ether containing molecules degrade more slowly. Materials containing strong carbon chlorine or carbon fluorine bonds generally don't degrade quickly. These bonds are shorter than other carbon halogen bonds and therefore they are stronger and so lots of energy is required to break them. Materials that are water soluble are likely to be biodegradable. Water soluble polymers include certain polyvinyl alcohols or hydroxyethyl celluloses. Biodegradation rates normally decrease with increasing molecular weight because there is more material to break down. Polylactic acid, or PLA, is one of the most commonly used degradable polymers. It has found its uses in compost bags and food packaging. Its low toxicity and high biodegradability makes it ideal for medical applications such as dissolvable stitches and controlled release devices. It can be made from either renewable or petroleum feedstocks and Cargill Chemical Company have developed a very sustainable renewable route. It is based on the fermentation of cornstarch with Lactobacillus acidophilus which is the bacteria that ferments sugars into lactic acid. The name is Latin for acid-loving milk bacterium. The intermediate calcium lactate is reacted with trialkylamine and carbon dioxide. This produces amine lactate and regenerates the calcium carbonate for reuse. This is then heated in hot water and the amine lactate decomposes into high-purity lactic acid and amine which can be used elsewhere. This gives the process a high atom economy because most of the products are put to good use. This means that the esterification purification step is avoided and this prevents the production of large amounts of calcium sulfate based waste. So once the lactic acid is produced we need to make the polymer PLA. We can't just use condensation polymerization of lactic acid because there is a competing depolymerization reaction which produces cyclic lactide. The equilibrium is reached before useful molecular weights of PLA have been formed. A solution to this problem is to isolate the lactide and polymerise it directly using a tin 2 ethyl hexanoate catalyst at 140 to 160 degrees centigrade. PLA will degrade in a compost environment whilst maintaining structural integrity while in use. It degrades through hydrolysis which will be explained later in this video. The microbes act on the broken down polymer to form carbon dioxide and water. This process needs available microbes, moisture and heat. The heat is to help the moisture with hydrolysis and it keeps the microbes active. It is expensive to produce PLA but its degradability and the fact that it uses 65% less energy than producing conventional plastics hopefully makes this cost worthwhile. Another type of biodegradable polymer is the photodegradable polymer. These are designed to become weak and brittle when exposed to sunlight for prolonged periods of time. One way to bring this about is to blend the polymer with light sensitive additives such as benzophenone which catalyse the breakdown of the polymer in the presence of UV radiation. UV absorbing groups such as carbonyl groups can be incorporated into the backbone of the polymer. 
These absorb light energy and break, fracturing the polymer chain and hence causing it to degrade. The polymers are initially converted to waxy compounds when exposed to light. They are then converted into carbon dioxide and water in the presence of bacteria. This last step in the process is biodegradation. Biodegradation is the chemical dissolution of materials by bacteria or other biological means. There are two main types of biodegradable plastics, hydrobiodegradable plastics or HBP and oxobiodegradable plastics or OBP. Both undergo chemical degradation first, resulting in physical degradation and a drastic reduction in molecular weight. These smaller, lighter fragments are then more susceptible to biodegradation. OBPs are made by adding a small portion of compounds of specific transition metals such as iron, manganese, cobalt or nickel into the normal production of polyolefins. These act as catalysts that speed up the normal oxidative degradation by factors of 10. HBPs tend to degrade and biodegrade more quickly than OBPs but they have to be collected in an industrial composting unit. Both processes give the same end result, water, carbon dioxide and biomass. OBPs are generally less expensive, possess better physical properties and can be made with current plastics processing equipment. Also, HBP emits methane when it degrades under anaerobic conditions, whereas OBP does not. However, before a polymer biodegrades, it often needs to be broken down into smaller fragments. One way of doing this is photodegradation, but it can also be done chemically by hydrolysis. The polymer must contain ester or amide groups, and then there are two ways in which these functional groups can be hydrolyzed. We will look at the example of a polymer containing ester groups like PLA. There is base hydrolysis, where the sodium salt of the carboxylic acid and the hydroxyl group is produced. Alternatively, there is acid hydrolysis, where the monomer units of the polyester are produced. This is a much slower reaction. It is important to remember that for this process to work, water must be present and so all reagents must be under aqueous conditions.